disciples to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. We're going to continue today in our study of, of Matthew's wonderful gospel, looking at a shorter section than we have seen recently. We've had many large portions uh, that Matthew has set before us, but we have a very brief one today. But the size of it has nothing to do with its significance. This is indeed uh, two very powerful uh, verses of this chapter and essential to the unfolding of God's eternal purpose in Christ. So may the Lord help us to see those things as we work through those verses today. Let's stand together and hear the word. Let's give our attention to God's inspired and infallible truth. We'll be reading verses 22 and 23. Verses 22 and 23. This is the word of God. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. We will remain standing for the morning prayer unless uh, you have some difficulty in, in continuing to stand. Uh, in that case, please feel free to be seated. Uh, we're not here to torment you. Uh, let's uh, otherwise remain standing in the Lord's presence. And let's lift our hearts together because he hears us in Christ. <clears throat> Our righteous and holy Father, Thou art glorious. Thou art holy, holy, holy. Pure and righteous. All-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. Our sovereign creator. Our gracious redeemer. Lord Jesus, thy word tells us that thou art not only our compassionate prophet, priest, and king, but that thou art the coming judge. O oh Lord, this is the day of salvation. This is the time for men to look away from their sins and look to Christ the risen Savior, for the pardon of sin. O oh, blessed God, blessed Lord Jesus, as thou sit and sittest enthroned at thy Father's right hand, how I pray, knowing that thou dost intercede for us even at this moment, that thou wilt receive our weak and feeble prayers, and that thou wouldst truly hear our hearts cry unto thee. We are crying to thee to pour out thy spirit. Pour out thy spirit, Lord. It is an evil day. A day in which we desperately need thee. to send thy spirit in great power into the hearts of the people of this nation. Lord, bring conviction of sin. Our nation no 
longer fears thee, O God. They do not, they do not fear to pursue the foulest, vilest, most violent of sinful actions. They strut in their arrogance and pride. Oh, please, Father, begin with thy professing people. Humble us. Make us to see our weakness, our utter dependency upon thee. Our desperate need of thy sanctifying power and grace. We need thy hand, thy spirit of life. Father, we're too busy. We are too busy for thee. I hear it. I hear this even from children. Busy, 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 busy. Oh God, may we not be idolaters of good things. But help us to stop and sit and bow our heads and learn from thy word and hear from thee and be transformed. I pray for the children of this congregation. O oh Lord God, how I praise and thank Thee for those that are memorizing Thy holy word. Bless them. Oh, may they ever bear those blessed truths in their hearts. May those truths be watered by thy spirit to grow into everlasting life. Father, many are catechized. And Lord, may the structure of that doctrine ever inform their minds. Many of them have learned psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Lord, and their minds are not filled day by day with the perversity that flows over the airwaves and over the televisions and across the internet. And they sing the songs of Zion with their parents. All good, Father. But bless it to their souls. Bless it to their souls. Awaken them. Draw them to life. Draw them to see their need of the Savior. Father, we pray that thou would stir those parents who ignore their children's souls. Oh God, shake them awake. Come with thy overtures. Open their eyes. Father, everyone that hears my voice this morning has an appointment in the day of judgment to give account. Lord, it is so that there are some standing in this very room who are not ready for that day. Save them. Please save them. Please pour out that glorious spirit. Give them light. Give them the understanding of the saving and forgiving power of Christ. Father, we pray for the sick in our congregation. Have mercy on those bodies, Lord, that are struggling, striving day by day. We pray for our sister Don, our brother Randy. Pray for my beloved wife, Lord, in her constant affliction. Pray, O oh God, for those that are sick. We pray for Grace Palmer this morning. We pray for others, O oh Father, that are sick and laid in the bed of of affliction and disease. Father, we do plead that thou wouldst give us ears to hear and, and eyes to see this morning, that we would not hear just a number in the list of sermons, but that we would hear from thee. How I praise thee for the prayer prayed earlier. Father, any leaves this place today having only heard me how poor their souls will be. 
But Lord, if thou dost empower thy word, and they will be rich. Come, come in that glorious power. Come, O God, with that quickening power of thy spirit. Lord, breathe joy into the hearts of thy people. Fill our hearts with grace overflowing. Fill our souls, O Lord, with the love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts. Strengthen us, encourage us, reprove us, build us up in the faith. But Lord, don't, don't leave us coasting. Don't leave us drifting. But draw our hearts up to thee today. May our lips be filled with praise and thanksgiving unto thee. Now bless thy sheep. Bless thy dear bride. O oh, blessed bridegroom. Wouldst thou come with thy blessed kisses. Whisper to our hearts. I am thy salvation. Speak to our souls. Reprove us where we need to be reproved. Lord, expose secret sin in this congregation. Do not let this be a cancerous nest of secret sin. Worship anesthetizing sin. Lord, draw all hearts to the cleansing blood of Christ and the freeing power of thy Holy Spirit. Now help me as I speak, as I speak to thy people. These are thy blood-bought people, Lord. They are not my possession. They are thine. Help me to handle thy word so that they will be built up in the faith and that the lost will know their need of the Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> this is a brief passage but filled with eternal truth or eternal truths that are instruction for God's children and food for the souls of God's hungry People, here our Lord prophesies a second time His coming death and resurrection. But He has plainly announced this very thing in chapter 16. Why does He need to repeat this strange report, this troubling, this painful prediction? Why? The answer is this. He is preparing for suffering and glory. He is preparing himself and he is preparing the disciples. This, of course, is the title of the message, Preparing for Suffering and Glory. And may God the Father, through the power of of His mighty Spirit, grant us ears to hear. Brethren, this text will show us how desperately we need the Spirit of God to hear His Word. You can hear a lecture, you can hear a sermon, you can agree with what you're hearing and walk out of the door unchanged. It must be God's illuminating, regenerating, sanctifying Spirit moving in our hearts and our souls. So that we grasp, so that we truly hear and understand, so that we are a changed people that the world may recognize as the followers of Jesus Christ. That we might hear the word, know our God, know his will, and know his power. If there is anything missing from much professing Christianity today, it is the power of the Holy Spirit. So, may our blessed Father grant us ears 
to hear, not just have an audio experience, but a hearing that we grasp and that we put to work in our lives. Eyes to see and hearts to believe our Savior as He teaches us here. So first we learn that Jesus and His disciples were once again in Galilee. Now, this raises a question. What has led us to this moment? How did we get here, back in Galilee, and what's going on prior to that so that we may understand this a bit more clearly? We could go farther back than I'm going to, but I want us at least to understand this. Here, we need to think carefully and to refresh our memories about what has gone before. We learn in chapter 16 that Jesus and His disciples left Galilee for the district of the Gentile city known as Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus asked them, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In answer to this, Peter replied, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now following this God-given revelation, Jesus prophesied for the first time His coming death and resurrection. Obviously shocked by this proclamation, Peter rejected it and rebuked the Son of the living God. Jesus, in turn, rebuked Peter, calling him Satan, because he was not focusing on the things of God. And Jesus' next announcement delivered yet another surprise. He said that some standing before Him would not die before they saw Him coming in His kingdom. After this, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into a a high mountain where He was transfigured before them. In an astonishing display of His deity and His heavenly glory, Jesus' face shined as bright as the sun. And His clothing became a dazzling white. Brighter than the light. Moses and Elijah, in a glorified state, also appeared with Jesus. As God spoke from a bright cloud. Brethren, we need holy, spirit-aided minds to sit and think through what's being described for us here. Oh, it's just another Bible story. Brethren, this was so astonishing, these disciples dropped as dead on their faces. We're, we barely lift an eyebrow when we read it. That's why we need the Spirit of God. I have to put a footnote here. Do you plead with God throughout the week that His Spirit will be poured out when we gather? You say, well, we're regenerate people. We have the Holy Spirit. We're as, as, as regenerate as we're going to be. We're saved as we're going to be. We've got the Holy Spirit. What else do we need? We are leaky vessels, if you want to put it that way. The Scriptures command us. Paul tells the Ephesians, be being filled with the Spirit. We can quench this blessed Spirit. We can grieve this Spirit. 
We can come in here with the wrong attitudes, with bearing grudges, with anger between husbands and wives and parents and children and church members among themselves or with the elders of the congregation. We can utterly destroy. We can be worship assassins by the way we come here. Are you pleading with the Lord throughout the week? Saying, Lord, pour out thy spirit. Help us. Help that preacher, whoever it is up here. Help us to hear thee. We don't need bedtime tales. We need God to speak. We don't need a religious pat on the back. You can go down to the YMCA and get that. Brethren, we need the living Christ, the resurrected Christ, to move in our hearts. He has done it from the time he was crucified, resurrected, and poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. We read it in the scriptures. We read it throughout history. We need our God to visit us with power. So that we can read something like this and say, is it not glorious That God transfigured His Son, showed us who He was, and He lets us be there on the mountain with them. He he records it in His Word so that we know what happened up in that high mountain. The rest of the world was sleeping. The rest of the world was worshiping its idols. (laughs) The other nine disciples were down failing and casting out a devil. But on that mountain... Christ showed His glory, His eternal glory. And His three disciples fell on their faces, overwhelmed at the rich spiritual feast before them. And God spoke from the cloud, this is my Son. Now in our scientific age, this is worse than fairy tales. One of the first things you hear atheists say, oh yeah, and, and little green men, men on the moon. When they stand before that God, they will remember every mocking jeer. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Oh, brethren, we don't want to be functional atheists. You can sit right here in this church pew Sunday after Sunday and be a functional atheist, living as if there were no God who reveals himself to man. Oh, it's a nice thought that floats around in your brain. It's something comforting when things are going on that distress you and trouble your life. But I'm telling you, brethren, the Christianity of this book is a supernatural thing. And it is something that transforms and makes people different. The world, will think, the world will think that you are just weird, odd, strange, cultic, idiots, rednecks, and a lot of other things. But when the Christ of God moves in the hearts of His people, all of a sudden it moves from being stories to the truth that fashions, shapes, and changes our lives. The disciples are getting this. They are seeing a progressive expansion of knowledge about Christ. And we see it culminate up there on top of that mountain. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. A personal audience with the living God. Three men. Hear ye him says God. And because we have it here, that makes us a part of that blessed moment. God has commanded us to hear Christ. Now, as these four men then descended the mountain, a question about Elijah arose. And Jesus affirmed that John the Baptist had indeed come in the power and spirit of Elijah. This is another clear pointer to the divine truth that Jesus was indeed what Peter confessed. The Christ, the Son 
of the living God. The hope of mankind. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about Messiah. Then, <clears throat> when Jesus, Peter, James, and John returned to the nine waiting disciples, they discovered that the nine had failed to cast a demon out of a young boy. And by the way, I need to stop and make a footnote. One of the reasons you should pray for your pastors is because they are fallible human beings. Last week, I shared an illustration from an event in my own life when I played football, which was not for very long in my life. <clears throat> I wasn't really very good at it. I apparently, um, I apparently took a couple of things that happened and put them all into one story from a 50-year-old experience. <clears throat> Actually, what happened is worse than what I told you. <laughs> And I need to clear that up right now. I want to make sure that I'm telling the truth as clearly as I possibly can. I said that I had looked up into the sun and dropped the football when the kickoff came. Uh, I, I had lots of fails in football, basketball, track, and swimming. I got cut from all the best teams in town. <clears throat> Uh, but it wasn't that fumble that was the problem that got the reaction that I mentioned. The reaction was completely right. Here's what happened. I actually caught the ball and took about three steps and fell on my face. I, there was nobody around me. It would have been great if like four or five big guys had taken me out. There was no one near me. The other team wasn't near me. I just fell. And then I had to sit on the bench and look at the coach and look at my fellow teammates and then face my dad later on. <clears throat> now, I brought it up then, and I simply remind you now, I bring this up not to talk about me. It gives me a good motivation not to talk about me in the future. But the fact of the matter is, dear brethren, God's people are going to fail, and failure is miserable. Failure is painful. Failure is distressing, no matter what. But it was especially difficult here for these disciples because Jesus had given them the power to cast out devils. This was part of their ministry. And they had done so successfully. Now, utter failure. Now, we've, we've gone back through these things because that gets us to this place. This has been taking place in Gentile country. Gentile country. Caesarea Philippi. We need to understand that underneath every one of these scenarios has been a theme that's been important to Matthew from the earliest chapters. But it is growing now as the revelation of Christ gets brighter. And that is faith. What was the problem with the disciples as they failed in casting out the devil? Christ told them instantly when they asked, Why couldn't we do it? Your lack of, un your, your lack of faith. Your unbelief. Brethren, there's no Christianity without faith. There is no Christianity without believing God. There is no, quote, success. Now, there's success in religion. You can get a building, put Christian church on it, and you can get an entertainer up in the pulpit, and you can fill up the building. And, and you, can, you can get guys that preach harmless enough sermons that just about anybody on the planet will come and listen to them. But that's not Christianity. That's precisely the kind of false stuff that the Lord warned about, and the apostles. This is a transforming religion. This is a walk with the living God. His power transforms. But how do we manifest that power? 
faith in him. If the Lord is truly dealing with us, we will, one, repent of our sins, and two, believe him. What's that got to do with our passage? It's the very foundation for what we're looking at. It says, our, our text says, and while they abode in Galilee. While they abode in Galilee. Now why does Matthew emphasize Galilee? Now, how interesting it is to note that the Apostle John mentions Jesus visiting Jerusalem several times during his ministry. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all focus on this coming journey to Jerusalem as if it were the only visit he made. This is, of course, because they wanted, uh, the, the authors of these Gospels wanted their readers to focus on Christ's all important appointment with the cross. That doesn't mean that John is not interested in that. But John is interested in telling the story in slightly different ways. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all focus on this trip to Jerusalem. So they were up uh, 20 or, or 20 plus miles above uh, Capernaum and uh, the areas of Galilee in Gentile land. Now they're back in Galilee. <clears throat> Our text indicates that Jesus and the disciples had traveled south from Caesarea Philippi to Galilee. And Mark gives us, as usual, a little more information. He says, they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. Apparently, this return would be brief. It would be private would not be like his public teaching and it would be instructive to his disciples with this stop Jesus was preparing for his solemn journey to the cross that loomed before him at Jerusalem now first for the sake of his disciples Jesus will announce his coming suffering in this passage verses 22 and 23 Secondly, in chapter 18, he will deliver his next major block of teaching. This will be the fourth major discourse of Christ in Matthew's gospel. And it will include even more about discipleship and instruction about the church, which he declared in chapter 16 that he would build. Because these men are going to go on after the resurrection and work with the risen Christ in establishing churches. Thirdly, chapter 19, verse 1, we will read that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. So Jesus returned to Galilee where he had begun his public ministry as the final stop of his journey to suffering and glory. Fourthly, he apparently gathered a larger group of disciples there, which included women, to make this journey to Jerusalem. Now, we don't see that immediately in this text, granted. But <clears throat> Matthew is going to tell us in chapter 27, verses 55 and 56, many women were there beholding afar off. This is the scene of the crucifixion. Many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's children. Now, these faithful women witnessed Jesus' crucifixion and became the first witnesses 
of his glorious resurrection. So, this is clearly a time of preparation before Jesus moves into the region of Judea. Galilee is the chosen place where Jesus' ministry had begun. He will leave it. It will be the last word. And he will go to what will eventually become his death upon the cross. This preparation, therefore, was crucial. So, our second main heading, Jesus introduced his fateful betrayal. Jesus then said to his disciples, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. Now, brethren, a text like this can almost look to us like filler for the story. You know, just a, well, here's, here's another little tidbit. But we, we must remember this is God's inspired, his infallible word. There's always a depth to what is being said that if we would stop and meditate on the scriptures, if we would read broadly through the scriptures, our understanding, the extent of our vision of what's being said before us will truly grow. And, and such is this kind of statement. It seems so simple. As with so many things that Jesus said, this brief statement is filled with both irony, contrast, and eternal light. It holds forth a thought that would have been unimaginable for a Jew. We miss it. because We're not Jewish here. As we have seen previously, the Son of Man was Jesus' favorite title for himself. And for him to apply it to himself means that he understood himself to be the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. I saw in the night, the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and a kingdom or there, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's Daniel 7, 13, and 14. The primary figure in this picture is the Son of Man, the one who comes before the Almighty and is given a glorious, eternal kingdom. This extraordinary figure, this deified figure, when it says coming with the clouds, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that kind of language in the Scriptures is pointing to deity. That's always ascribed to God in the Old Testament. So what we have before us is a figure that is a God-man. He's the Son of Man, and yet He comes in the clouds. <clears throat> Here, my, my, my brethren, is a, a kingdom, a dominion, that will govern all people. Not just a few. All nations and all languages. Here is a true, universal, and absolute monarch. And worthy of it. What splendid, majestic, glorious power and triumph we see in this passage. But how could this mighty Son of Man, this God-man figure, be betrayed into the hands of men? Do you, do you get the issue there? Do you, do, you, do you see the picture? There's a serious clash for a Jewish mind here. Someone who's the king of everything, but he's going to be turned over to the hands of men? Well, that would be, on the surface of it, a confusing statement. 
That would be confusing. The Jews could not grasp this. How does the idea of the mighty, majestic king with an everlasting kingdom fit with betrayal into the hands of mere men? Those men, of course, were the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and it will include the Gentile leaders as well. This, my brethren, is the great mystery of the Christ. This is the mystery of the Christ, of the incarnation. The eternal Son of God became the Son of Man so that He might save His people from their sins and so that He might be given the glories of the kingship of the kingdom. This is the heart and soul of God's eternal purpose. Only a betrayed, suffering Savior will be the omnipotent sovereign of God's kingdom. Remember Matthew's theme. No suffering, no glory. No suffering, no glory. We're not talking about Suffering as in a flood came and took my home away, uh, uh, a fire uh, destroyed uh, my home, my business. I've lost a loved one. We're not talking about that kind of suffering. That's a real suffering. It's powerful, can be life changing, but that's not the kind of suffering he's talking about here. He's talking about suffering as the Lamb of God. Suffering as the substitute for his people, suffering upon the cross of Calvary, suffering at the hands of wicked men that would beat him, flog him, spit on him, and hang him in the air, as if heaven would not have him, nor earth. Without that suffering, there is not his glory. His ruling and reigning in that kingdom forever. This was God's eternal purpose. And Jesus is working it out. But the skewed view that the Jews have of Messiah keeps them from understanding what's unfolding before their eyes. And Christ's disciples themselves don't get it apart from God the Father opening their minds, as we've already seen. My brethren, for Christ, there must be first weakness, then strength. First, humility. And then exaltation. This is the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity who becomes man so that he can do what God cannot do. And that is to die. To die. There must be death before Jesus Christ becomes the kingdom, becomes the king of the kingdom of life. Now, it is true, in one sense, Christ has always been the king of the kingdom because that was God's plan. It never could be anything but that. But we're talking about the experience in history. Christ would have to go through the fires of God's wrath before he sat enthroned on the kingdom for eternity. And that's what is unfolding before us. The disciples are wrestling with it. They can't get it. And neither would we. Unless the Lord gives us the light in his word. Not only to hear the words. But to understand. Grasp and believe. This is what Jesus was teaching his disciples. This is why he was preparing them for Jerusalem. The idea of a dying Messiah. Did not fit their understanding 
a suffering, dying Messiah was the absolute opposite of what they wanted. They wanted a conquering king who would destroy the Romans, who would destroy all the enemies of the Jews so that the Jews and Messiah could reign over the world. This is what they were hoping for. And now Jesus is saying, I'm going to die. Now, I trust we can at least struggle a little bit with the disciples there. Not making sense. We've watched him heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. And now he's talking about dying. Well, having announced that someone would betray him into the hands of Jewish and Gentile leaders, number three, Jesus then prophesied the certainty of his death and his resurrection again. Despite the fact that Peter, by the grace of God's revelation, had declared Jesus to be the Christ, despite the fact that Jesus had revealed His dazzling glory, His unspeakable beauty on the Mount of Transfiguration, despite the fact that God the Father announced from a bright cloud, shining, splendent, that Jesus was His beloved Son, the disciples still did not understand and therefore did not believe God the Father's purpose for Jesus Christ His Son. This is why Peter got so uppity. And Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. No! May that never be! But, as we remember, I trust, Peter's, after Peter's confession, our Lord began to show them this very thing. How that he must go unto Jerusalem. And look at the word must. Yes, it's a four-letter verb, and we probably use it all the time, very often, in ways that doesn't really apply. We must this or must that, when often we don't must. But when Jesus says must... Brethren, he is talking the eternal purpose of God. It must happen because this is what God has ordained. This is what he has planned. There isn't any possibility that it would not happen. By the way, men don't like a God that rules. And this is a God who rules, who has ordained things before the foundation of the world that are taking place not only then not only from the very time of the garden of eden but to the very moment in which we live god is ruling so jesus has told them that he must go to jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the priests and of the the, the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day this brought forth Peter's impulsive, ignorant, and prideful rebuke. Nevertheless, let us hear the important verbs that Jesus uses now in this passage. He shall, well, uh, first in chapter 16, uh, he must. And then now in our passage, verses 22 and 23, he shall be betrayed. Not might. They shall kill him. And the third day, he shall be raised again. Christ is speaking with certainty. And there it is in three simple sentences. The certainty of Jesus' death. The certainty of his resurrection. His suffering and his glory. Death. Suffering. Rising again. His glory. His glory. In a world filled with uncertainties, unexpected changes, and unseen variables, how could Jesus be so sure? I'm always amazed when human beings tell me things uh, that they say with dogmatic breath. 
This is what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen to the economy. Here's what's going to happen to this and that and the other. And then very often, <laughs> in fact, I think probably the most amazing illustration we have on the planet of this is weather people. <laughs> that not so? I've never heard one of them say, never once in my entire life, you know, we're not sure what the Lord's going to do, but it looks like rain tomorrow. Never. 90% chance of rain, you know, everybody get ready for the flood, and then everyone goes out for a picnic in the sunshine. Right? Wrong. All the time. With unbelievable dogma. I wonder if there's such a thing as a humble weather person. And stop and think about it. They're wrong so often because they don't know the God who rules the wind and the waves. And they're not counting on Him. Their machines are telling them this, that this is probably going to happen. It doesn't always. It's a shame. Well, brethren, so how could Christ be so dogmatic? This will happen. This will happen. This will happen. The certainty of his words and his actions were rooted in God's eternal purpose. They point to the holy, eternal covenant of redemption in which God chose his son. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. God doesn't say maybe. He just says what he's going to do. And he does it. And Christ is the living God come in the flesh. The son agreed to this. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. It is written of me. I come to do thy will, O God. Psalm 40, verse 7, in Hebrews 10, 7. As a child, Jesus had said to Joseph and Mary, Wist ye not, or know ye not, children, that word wist is an old term that means know ye not, that I must be about my father's business? At 12, he understood the appointment of God. As a man, Jesus openly declared in the synagogue, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Isn't that a remarkable moment in history? The Messiah stands in the synagogue, calls for the scroll, uh, and turns to Isaiah and reads from Isaiah this very passage. And, it, and this event is recorded for us by Luke in chapter 4 of his gospel in which the Lord Jesus speaks Isaiah's prophecy and then says, Today, this has come true right before your very eyes, right in your ears. Jesus came to do his Father's will. He said later, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. By the way, that should be on the lips of every Christian. My meat, what I feast on, is what God's given me to do. Whatever that is. Not only that, the Lord Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Everlasting life. I mean, does this echo in anybody's heart? Everlasting life. There is an everlasting death called hell, a death that never dies. And in Christ, there's everlasting life. 
and that should move in our souls. This is what Christ said he's come to do. How will this be accomplished? By going to Jerusalem and being betrayed, hung upon a cross, and then rising again the third day. That's how. That's the Father's will. It's as clear from Genesis to Revelation and as it can be. If you read this book, constantly looking for Christ, you will see him in the types and shadows of the old covenant. And you will see him in his glory in the new covenant. Jesus was plainly proclaiming the certainty. This is why it was certain. God purposed it and Christ came to accomplish it. And in this, he was fulfilling, listen carefully, in doing this, in doing the Father's will, he was fulfilling the beauty of his name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, the salvation of Jehovah. Jehovah's saving. Jehovah's salvation. What a beautiful name. That's what he came to do. It would not be accomplished any other way than a trip down to Jerusalem and dying on the cross of Calvary, rising again the third day. Then he could say, as he does at the end of the book, all power, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. This is why we call him Lord. It's not a nice religious word. Lord means our ruler. He owns us. He bought us with his blood. He governs us with his word. He empowers us with his spirit. So, that brings us to number four. It is absolutely true that Christ spoke with certainty because it was in fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. But Jesus' disciples failed to see the importance of his prophecy. How did the disciples react to the second announcement? How did they react? Well, we know how Peter reacted at the first one. Lord, may that never be. Well, now they don't say that. The text simply says, and they were exceeding sorry. Now, if you're drifting, this is a time to pull back up to the shore, tie up, and listen carefully. This is important, brethren. At first glance, this might seem like the logical, normal human response to Jesus' announcement. But Matthew likes to emphasize important moments with understated responses upon which he does not elaborate. We've had a number of them in our study so far. He likes to emphasize important moments with understated responses upon which he does not elaborate as if he were waiting for us to get it. He's waiting for us to get it after we think about what he said for a few minutes. The problem is, ah, got to go. We're always busy. We don't sit and meditate in God's word. We don't stop and say, wait a minute. He says he's going to be resurrected. And they're sad. What's going on here? When Jesus announced his coming death and resurrection previously, Peter had outright denied it. He rejected it. But now the disciples are weighed down with grief. They seem ever so slowly to be accepting Jesus' troubling words. Okay, they're, they're starting to get that part. He's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to die. But why this response 
of overwhelming distress and mental anguish. Why? Well, I would say at least three reasons. One, because this just did not fit the Jewish idea of the Christ. And you need to bear that in mind as you read through Matthew's gospel. And we need to understand that because very often we get modern American religion that's often called Christianity shoved down our throats 24 hours a day, distorting the scriptures very often like the Jews distorted them. And we have ideas about Christ and ideas about the end of the world and ideas about Christ's second coming that really can't be supported from the scriptures. But they can have an incredible impact on our thinking and the way we read this book. So, one, because it just did not fit the Jewish idea of the Christ. Number two, because the disciples seem to have heard the words, they shall kill him, but do not seem to have grasped, the third day he shall rise again, conquering that death. They heard the defeat, but they didn't hear the victory. They heard no triumph, no joy, no conquering in his rising again. And number three, because they did not understand the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection. They're just grieving over, they really don't get it, over what must happen in order for Christ to be triumphant and to take his glorious throne as the king of the kingdom. They did not understand, in spite of the fact they heard the words, they did not understand that Christ's death and resurrection was the glory or were the glorious accomplishment of the forgiveness of sins and of eternal life. They're still thinking military triumph. When Christ came to save his people, not from the kings of the world, but from their sin. To set them free from Pharaoh, Satan. Every single human being on this planet who is not in Christ is a subject of Satan. Oh, it has a lot of different dresses, a lot of different garb. It looks different in various places, various countries. Sometimes it's wrapped up in religion, and sometimes it's wrapped up in vomit in the gutter. But it's all the same wicked master over human beings. Jesus, in rising from the dead, triumphed over the world, the flesh, and the devil. It was vital that he die and rise again. And he's patiently waiting for his disciples to get this. He's announced it once, and it was outright rejected. He brings it up again because he's preparing. He's preparing for suffering and glory. Believers throughout the ages... That is, those that have read the New Testament writings understand that Christ's bloody, agonizing death and his victorious resurrection were the full accomplishment of God's glorious plan of redemption. Look, look, look at Calvary. Look at a broken body, broken, swollen beyond recognition from its, the violent beating. Look at the stinking spittle running down his face. Look at his body broken and him dying as he's gasping for breath. And he's between two thieves. He doesn't look like a king. He looks like a failure. An utter failure. But brethren, in that very moment, when he said, it is finished. The eternal redemption of his people was completed. Christ not only did not fail, 
He crushed the serpent's head. And he plucks his people out of Satan's grasp day by day as it pleases him, the king. The conquering king. The resurrected king. Yes, when we look at the cross, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. Right? Isn't this what we sing? Well, brethren, we do weep when we see our sins, when we realize our nasty, ugly, perverse, atheistic thoughts dwell in our minds, our unbelieving thoughts, ravage our thinking. When we think about the words that have come out of our mouths that have destroyed people, that have ruined them, that have ruined situations, that have, uh, have mutilated children and wives sometimes. When we think about the words that come out of our mouth, rebellion against our parents, I'll tell them, I'll show them all. We see in Christ what those sins cost. When we think the, about the wickedness that we've done, the lies that we've told, the covetousness that burns in our heart, the lust, the adultery, the fornication, the stealing. This is what put Christ upon the cross. We look and we can weep. We can weep at what we've been. But don't just get maudlin and emotional and go, oh, I look at Jesus and his broken body and it makes me sad. Stop! Now you're thinking like the disciples. Why is he there? Because he's paying the exact penalty for all of the sins of all of God's people for all of eternity. And then he triumphantly rises from the dead, utterly crushing the enemy. And now, ascended up into glory, he rules at the Father's right hand, interceding for his people every moment of every day, strengthening them throughout their walk with him, helping them in their sorrows, helping them as they fight their spiritual battles, as they wrestle against sin. And not only that, he's wooing sinners to himself. He puts his finger, the Holy Spirit, on their hearts and makes them see what they are. He makes them see and understand and feel that they deserve the wrath of God, but that there's hope in a risen Savior. This rising, this crucifixion and rising again is the heart and soul of what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. You see, now, chapter 16, and here into chapter 17, that's all brought us to this. And we must have faith in Him. Faith in Him. You must believe the biblical record. Otherwise, there's no pardon of sin. My brethren, Christ's death and resurrection were the very reason for the incarnation, the full and successful atonement for all His people, and the securing of everlasting life for all, all, all who repent and believe. Children, repent. Change your mind about your sins, about your rebellions, about your selfishness. And look to Christ. Adults, it's the same message. Turn from your sins, change your mind, and look to the risen Christ, trusting Him that died upon Calvary's cross, having been betrayed, as we will learn later, by one of His own disciples. Jesus is preparing Himself and His disciples from the most horrific crime in history, the execution of the ultimate innocent man. Day after day in the newspapers, this fellow put to death, and it turns out he was innocent. And people grieve, and we should, don't misunderstand me, 
but I never hear the same papers say 2,000 years ago the greatest offense against an innocent person took place and we should all be grieved. Uh, uh, our, our, the Roman Empire put to death a man who, had, who was guilty, guilty, guilty of raising the dead, healing lepers, healing the sick and the diseased, reaching down to the un touchables and showing them the love of God oh this is a foul creature now there's never been a greater crime in the history of justice among human beings we don't hear those complaints do we but Jesus had to die and rise again to crush the serpent's head to establish the kingdom and to secure the eternal glories of the world to come and there was just a little taste of that up on the mountain. You see his glory. That's just, just a little taste of what's coming. So how do we apply this? We need to make some quick applications. What, is this, what do these two verses then mean for us? How do we live with this tomorrow? One, let us take comfort. You hear those words? Let us take comfort in the truth that God does not cast off his disciples because they do not fully understand him. Now, this ought to humble us. Listen, these men had been with Jesus for over two years at this point, maybe three. They had lived with him day in and day out. They saw his glory. That's why John wrote in his gospel, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten. But John didn't understand some things before he wrote that gospel. And by God's grace and by the illumination of God's spirit, he could write them. And we will not believe these things unless the spirit of God opens our hearts to do so. How clear it is that Jesus was long-suffering. Like that word, if you didn't hear Pastor Clarence's message on Wednesday, you need to get it and hear it. And how clear it is that Jesus was long-suffering. He was patient with his slow disciples. How encouraging and comforting it should be for us to know that he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are but dust. Psalm 103, 14. And for he remembereth that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Psalm 78, 39. We should strive by grace through faith in prayer and the study of God's word to understand the way more clearly. Don't just say, oh, saved by grace. What else do I need to know? Moving on with life. No, the Lord calls us to grow in understanding, to grow in his word, to grow in the grace of knowledge and knowledge of the living Christ. But let us remain humble in what we do learn. Knowing that if any man thinketh that he knoweth anything, says Paul, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Secondly, secondly, let us take comfort that Jesus' death and resurrection fulfilled God's eternal purpose of redemption, accomplishing full and free salvation for sinful human beings. There's comfort there. Now, if the only way you're going to be happy in life is for things to go your way, you're going to be a very disappointed human being, even if you manage to become dictator of your region. Whether it's your house, you're going to find that no matter how hard you try, everything's just not going to go your way. If your happiness is in people, I'm marrying this young woman because she's beautiful and she's going to make me happy. Number one, you're going into marriage as an idolater. And number two, she's going to disappoint you. Our gods, our man-made gods, always fail us. I'm going to marry this fine young man because he'll love me and I'll be happy. That This is idolatry. I want to marry this man because I want the two of us to walk together in Christ and to honor the Lord 
as we covenant together to be man and wife and to bring up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now we're starting to sound a little bit more like the scriptures. Knowing that you're going to marry a sinner and be married to that sinner for life. But God doesn't promise us happiness in circumstances. God promises an eternal joy that cannot be taken away because of the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. That's our hope. That's where rejoicing in this world goes to. Jesus is God's beloved son because the father loved the son and the son loved the father from all eternity. There is salvation for the sinful people of this world. If you're here without Christ today, repent, change your mind and come to this Christ. He has promised, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He will Pardon your sins because his blood was shed on Calvary's cross. He will pardon your sin because he stood in the place of all those who repent and believe on Christ. Everything about Christ's life made him the perfect sinner, the sin-bearing substitute for his people. Jesus loved every one of his people by name before he ever came into the world. And because he loved his bride, the church. Because of this, he gave his back to the smiters and his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. He hid not his face from shame and spitting. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, God, and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed this is why Jesus became a man this is why he had to suffer in these sufferings he was paying forever the the wretched cost of our sins. And he was satisfying forever the justice of God toward us. He is that substitute. And do you get that? Substitute. That means you and I should die that way. What do you and I deserve before God? To be stripped naked publicly. To be, to be chastened. To be scourged. Till to the skin is, is plowed off of our backs and our sides and our ribs showing. This is what was happening to Christ as they scourged his body. Substitute. You think you're okay? Look at Christ and you'll understand what God thinks of sin. Look at his hands, his feet, his head. His blood comes flowing down. You should die publicly, shamefully, and so should I. Christ died in our place. He accomplished redemption so that we have a full and free salvation. You tell someone with AIDS or some other disease which the doctors say, we don't know, we can't help you, we can't fix it. You said, I've got the cure. People will pay everything they've got for it. They'll go to any country that they can to get it. Jesus says, don't come with your money. Don't come with your good works. They don't measure up. The law demands perfection. I kept the law. I paid the penalty of the law. Trust me for your righteousness. This is what God accomplished in Christ. This is why he had to die and rise again at Jerusalem. Well, finally, let us take comfort in the truth that God will accomplish everything then in his eternal purpose of redemption. We're out of time. But God's sovereignty is a truth little known, little understood, and little faithfully preached in our day. But that is the doctrine that stands like the rock of Gibraltar behind everything going on here. God's absolute sovereignty ruling and reigning over every aspect of, 
of, of human history and Jesus Christ accomplishing exactly what he was sent to do. I don't have time to develop this. We'll simply close it with this. God's eternal purpose is not simply for the pardon of our sin. I would be happy, as I've said many times before, and I imagine you would think about this and, and come to a, a, at, least, at least approximately the same conclusion. Just to have my sins forgiven, my crimes against heaven wiped out, I'd be, I could be happy for eternity. But God's salvation is far more than that. It's not just about having our sins washed away. It's being made like Christ. The scripture says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will reign in the splendor of heaven with Christ for all eternity. No sickness, no sorrow, no theft, no rapes, no perversion, no more violence. The glory of eternity in Christ Jesus, a world of love. What the, what the world here is so longing for, they will never accomplish with their money. They will never accomplish it with their global economy. They will never accomplish it with their UN and their peacekeeping troops. It's never going to happen. Because men's hearts aren't changed. But when Christ conquers by grace and draws someone to him, he not only pardons him, but he's given him glorious promises that 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 glorious and majestic kingdom which we long for, which we long to live in, is coming. And we will see it. It's certain. Because Jesus died and rose again. So this is just a small passage, but it's big in what it points to. Jesus had stopped over in Galilee to prepare for suffering and glory in Jerusalem. Let us realize that as he prepared his beloved disciples for this extraordinary experience, they could not fully grasp it, and neither do we. But let us look by faith to Christ and plead with him to open our understanding of who he is and what he's accomplished for everlasting life. Amen. Oh, Christ Jesus, how we need Thee. Father in heaven, I pray that Thy Spirit has been at work in the hearts of those here and those that will hear this. We have no desire but that Christ would be exalted. Now, Lord, do thy mighty work according to thy grace, according to thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brethren, please stand with me. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, brethren, today is our first of the month meal together. If you are visiting with us, you are welcome to stay. We have plenty of food. We would be glad to share our lunch with you. We have a time of eating together, fellowship, and then we have the Lord's Supper. You are welcome to stay. The deacons will let us know when they're ready in the back. We'll fellowship in here until that time. Amen. Jeff, I a guy from Little Rock, the retired doctor that wrote you and said, uh, I remember when you were singing in New Orleans.
Is that right? You remember that? Yes, I do remember that. Yes. That was you. Yes. Praise 